Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is your illustrious not host, Benjamin Wandio, here with your host for today's episode, Todd. Hey, hey, Dirty hey. Clyde how are you, Wandio? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there was too much pause there. I had to jump in. I felt yeah, well, like there was, was dead I space. I was kind of hoping he'd pick up, and then you would just come in and introduce yourself. But I, I mean, okay. want to try it again? No, it's okay. <laughs> At this point, people know who we are. Um, I guess so. You're listening to the Kanakanomicon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Canadian history podcast that. Uh, isn't true crime most of the time, but today it is. <laughs> yeah, yes, it, it's it's true crime, and I mean there are parallels between Nishmak and uh, the guy that runs the country to the south of us. Oh my goodness! Well, that'll be interesting. Yeah, just not not connections. Like there's no no, no like, but like you know, parallels. No, but the the. The parallels are uncanny, just how bizarre <laughs> these individuals are. I mean, no kidding. Yeah. yeah anyway. Yeah. Well, I, so. I started yoga this week. Yeah, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> well, I, I'm a very large gentleman. And what I've discovered is that when you're large... You uh, really develop the muscles in your legs. And there was a pose that we had to do where my um, my wife was doing it. And she had to put up some like wooden blocks underneath her knees to keep her legs from folding down too far. But the muscles in my legs are so overdeveloped. They're like steel cords. Yes. And so when I'm going into this pose, my legs don't even hurt. I'm not even feeling a stretch. But my legs are hovering in the air. Just from the tension oh. on my uh on my 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 muscles. <laughs> <laughs> They're just like Solid steel beams that just won't stretch at all. <laughs> yeah, they'll they'll get there little by little. Uh, that's the hope, and uh, hopefully I'll lose some weight in the process and maybe become a little more supple, a little less uh, yes, uh, uh, chonk tastic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sorry you're doing yoga. I'm not. It's it's a it's a way there's to spend a, my evening that isn't video games, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's a lot of farting in yoga. I managed to not fart in my first session. Okay, on on Netflix, have you watched Medical Police? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is it <laughs> Oh boy. It's it's actually funny. It is it it is totally stupid, but um, but there's a scene where they go into this. They're in I don't know Czechoslovakia or something like that, mm-hmm. a- and uh, they go into this disco where everybody's wearing headphones, so everybody's listening to the same tune on oh, the headphones. Oh yeah, yeah. One of, those one of those silent, silent discos. Discos. But as you're walking through, all you hear is little farts breaking out everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. I might because it's silent, this. right? Yeah. You, know, you got <laughs> like, it, it's so stupid. You almost want to turn it off, but then you don't because it's just, it's just funny. So anyway. Well. No. Uh, on that cheery we note, get right into it. Let's yeah. get to the murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're you're well, doing this episode. So why don't you t- <coughs> take it away? D- d- okay. Today, Knuckleheads, we delve into the sordid world of the rich. It is a dark place, a place where money can buy just about anything except loyalty. 
this world teems with entitled individuals who perceive solutions to problems as being limited only by how deeply one can peer into the darkness, how far one can reach into the ooze of evil before pulling out a workable fix. Today, dear friends, we discover the scent of evil, a man willing to do anything for money, whose silver tongue and manipulations know no bounds. I'm not even talking about Donald Trump, but doesn't that sound like him? (laughs) Welcome, rubberneckers, to the dark world of Peter Demeter. This is the Canuckonomicon. That literally just sounds like everyone with more than $10 million to their name. Yeah. (laughs) I don't even know if this guy actually had any real money. (laughs) Like, he's very... to, to, To me, he's very... He... He very much is like that, that Donald Trump or Peter Pocklington, guys who use other people's money to gain power and prestige so, and tell everybody how rich they are. So, so literally the entirety of Silicon Valley. Like money is real. Guys are tr- <laughs> Once you get to Silicon are truly Valley. Rich. I mean, it's barely yeah, real are- outside of it. But within Silicon yeah. Valley, those startups, like money isn't real. <laughs> Yeah. Uber hasn't turned a profit in its entire existence. That's crazy. Yeah. I I don't know. And, you know, guys like you and I, schlups who, you know, work a day jobs and whatever. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just can't even, I can't get a loan to buy a car. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And, and yet these guys, they go up to like those venture capitalists and just say... I've got this crazy idea. It's going to be the next Apple. And yeah. the venture capitalist goes, well, I've got $100 billion that banks won't let me store, so have some. <laughs> yeah, hey, have some. Because <laughs> money's money not real. On paper. <laughs> yeah. 23-year-old Hungarian-Austrian dissident Peter Demeter fled Hungary in 1956 as Russian tanks and troops flooded into the country. Son of a once wealthy family, Demeter fled the country with 200,000 others, avoiding possible imprisonment and certain that to stay would mean a return to communist rule following the 1956 revolution. Now, um, that's the... uh, that's the one, like, okay, so sh- shortly after the Second World War, uh, the Soviet Union is now taking over all these right. Eastern European countries, yeah. right? Setting up little blocks, so they call them the Soviet bloc nations. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, so Hungary was one of those that was sort of um, an unwilling partner in this. Right. And so there was a democratic movement afoot. There was, there's a lot of uh, businessmen and stuff. Yeah, that so were this was just pl- playing the game. This was a like kind of rush the, the era of Russian imperialism. So while America is going around, you know, intervening in like the Middle East and stuff yeah. in an attempt to contain the spread of. Russia. I guess at this yeah. time it would have been Korea, not so much the Middle Korean East. Korean War, that's right. Yeah. 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 So they're there in Korea yeah. and stuff trying to, to halt the spread of Russia that way. But in mm-hmm. Europe, there's, I guess, kind of hope that the rest of Europe will just do it for them. Yeah. And the rest <laughs> of Europe is just sort of laying down. Well, because the rest of Europe's like, <laughs> we've been ripped apart by two wars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Precisely. Anyway, Demeter, Demeter, P- Peter Demeter, because it because it rhymes <laughs> sounds better. But it, I think his actual name was Demeter. Mm. But um, he comes out of this uh, environment of of sort of uh, being an entitled individual already, coming from a family of wealth, and then losing that wealth. Right. So he goes to Canada, as you do, I and, guess. Yeah. Yeah, and um, so, you know, a young guy, uh, he gets into, uh, he gets real estate development, that sort of stuff. Life was hard in Hungary, and by comparison, life was, you know, grand in Canada. And Demeter quickly rose uh, to wealth as a land developer in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
he had the gift of gab and the ability to convince people of just about anything, which is how he convinced former Austrian model Christine Ferrari to be his wife. Oh, boy. If you've seen pictures of Peter Demeter, he is not an attractive man. No. Um, you know, he, he's got these big old, like, uh, car window glasses... Right, uh, but so he, sort of cr- cr- crooked teeth. But he was a nineteen fifty six man with money. Yeah, like he, he looks like Austin Powers actually oh. in the night. <laughs> oh, good. Of, <laughs> look that he's <coughs> that he's trying to channel. So, so he was one of and, those guys who could just talk his way out of everything. Yeah, pretty when, much. Like, um, or talk his way into anything. R- yeah, right. But, what, like, did he do it just by, like, the kind of the Trump way where he just kept talking until eventually people gave him what he wanted? Uh, I couldn't find a lot of information about how he conducted his business affairs. Right. I don't think anybody was really interested. But, you know, being a land developer, a real estate developer, coming from, uh, you know, an Eastern Bloc nation, I mean, he was just the kind of guy who had contacts in really shady places, as we'll see. Right. And... Didn't seem to have any morals about it. Well, that that's how was, you get ahead in business. Is just, yeah. you look at people. But as, he was able to. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No. <laughs> he, <laughs> no, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> when when you get into business, like if you look at people as human beings, um, you're not going to get very far. Like, yeah. there are some people on, like, Dragon's Den and, and Shark Tank and stuff like that where, like, they seem really nice and, like, people you could sit down and have a beer with. But if you really examine yeah. how they conduct themselves in business, what you realize is that humanity is like a thin veneer that cracks the moment you start poking at it. Yeah. <laughs> like, the moment you really start examining what they had to do to get to be where they are. They look at people as resources. That's why it's called human resources, right? Yeah. Yeah, people are, are marks. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're only removed from con men by a thin veneer. Mostly by success. I mean, <laughs> mostly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you're right there. <laughs> you know. Um, so anyway, I mean, he did convince a supermodel to be his wife. And that seemed to be... Uh, you know, a, a fairly workable situation. The two got married. They settled down. Um, they had at least one daughter who we'll meet a little bit later on. Um, and they lived, you know, in the in the best part of, uh, of town. And they uh, settled down to a life of high finance and Ontario-ism. <laughs> Ontario-ism. Well, Yes, you know, wealth, luxury, weird parties. <laughs> Upper class <laughs> East Coasters, yeah. It was weird. Like, they were swingers, and they, you know, did the wife-swapping thing in their community. Oh, boy. They didn't and this seem to have the, any... This would be in the, the 60s at this point, right? Or the 70s? Yeah, we're looking at, yeah, in the 60s. In this, okay. Uh, so yeah. this is also so, the era for that sort of stuff, to like kind of start right. becoming more mainstream. 68, 70. I mean, if you think Austin Powers. Yeah. That's the that, that's kind of, that's the kind of, it's the, you know, lifestyle. It's the disco the, the lifestyle. Shag and baby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not even that, it's not even the um, disco, like, you know, we talk is Studio 42. Is that what it was no, called? Studio it was. 6. Whatever. The one in New York where... All the coke. It wasn't even that yet. It was just the, the swingers and free love and. Ugh. It was the yeah. transition. By the sounds of it, it's like yeah. kind of the transition between between that because, like the yeah. '60s was like kind of uh, lots of like kind of proto-communist, sort of democratic socialist movements that kind of led to like free love and civil rights and stuff like that. Um, That's right. But then it, it, it those people got rich. Right, yeah. They they became yeah. the man that they hated so much in the '60s, like you see happening yeah. now yeah. with millennials, like my generation. Yes. Yeah. As we come into power, we're we're starting to become more and more sucked into the machine. 
Um, like so you just yeah yeah. So anyway, they were the talk of the town. These two. Uh, Peter was a striking figure with his square horn rimmed glasses and his Hungarian demeanor. <laughs> Hungarian <laughs> demeanor. <laughs> like, what does that even mean? <laughs> no, I, I don't know. But anyway, so six years pass. On the evening of July 18th, 1973, Christine is found dead, face down in a pool of her own blood, and Demeter had artfully managed to have his extended family and friends with him on a shopping trip as she was being bludgeoned to death. What the hell? Like, he, <laughs> he, he actually goes to extreme measures. They had some house guests with them. And he decides one day they're going on a shopping trip. And uh, the house guests say, oh, we just want to sort of hang out here. He says, no, no, you're coming with me. And he takes a whole bunch of them. He, he uh, at some point, he goes to make a phone call to phone his wife uh, and uh, talk to her on the phone. And the one person, uh, the house guest that, that, that overheard the conversation said, he seemed surprised that she answered. <laughs> and then, um, then he made them stay shopping for another two hours. Huh. Then he finally brings them home and they find her in the garage beside the car with blood everywhere, like blood everywhere. There's actually uh, photos on the internet you can check out if you're so inclined. It's just a gruesome sight. So, and I'm guessing he put on a big show of how bereaved he was. I don't, they, they don't mention that he's upset, but they, they sort of say that, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he's making a big, de- he at first says to the cops, she must have fallen. What? <laughs> That's what he said. She, she must have fallen. She fell and just sprayed blood everywhere. It was like a geyser. Everywhere. <laughs> that's what he, t- so that's what he tells them on the phone is that I think my wife fell, fell down and, and killed herself. So. <laughs> He's trying to make it sound like it was some some accidental kind of death, and the co- cops get there and they're pretty sure right away that it's a murder. I mean, there's there's blood spray from the hammer all over the side of the car. Yeah, like and they f- they figure a hammer was used. They never uh, did find uh, the murder weapon. No, uh, it's like when I was living uh, in that one apartment, the first apartment I lived in with my wife. <laughs> There was that guy yeah. that was killed with, at the time, it was a, a machete or samurai sword. And eventually they determined it was indeed a samurai sword. Yes. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> um. Aren't you glad I moved so, out of that place? Yeah, well, it was, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> It was pretty gruesome stuff, this murder, though. It was the stuff of, like, psychopathic dreams. Mm -hmm. Only a madman or someone hired by one could commit such a deed. (laughs) And the way he, uh, and the way he, um, you know, orchestrated this whole event, you know, so that he had everybody out of the house, except the wife. Yeah. Yeah. No, you stay here, make cook some supper, I'm taking everybody or something. I don't even know what excuse he finally gave for why she stayed behind. Yeah, that's... But he was pretty emphatic everybody else had to go. That's very bizarre. Yeah, that's not suspicious no. at all. <laughs> so, as the police start their investigation, Peter quickly became a suspect. Um, the details emerged that the marriage was souring. Uh, both parties... Uh, we're tired of being together. So get a divorce. And on Peter, <laughs> yeah, right. And on Peter's <laughs> part, at least, he already had another beautiful Austrian model waiting in the wings. <clears throat> so this guy obviously has a little bit of prestige and, uh, you know, he's a socialite in, in the mm-hmm. Toronto circles, uh, has this girlfriend. Right. That they find. Right. Mm-hmm. So, 
uh, apparently the wife was also sort of sleeping around and whatever. Um, not surprising they were swapping wives at parties and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but she had pretty much had enough of the marriage and he'd had enough of it, but, um, he, he kind of, remember, he's an opportunist. Right. He's, in addition to the infidelity, he, uh, Demeter is, uh, reported to have offered at least two people money in order to murder his wife. And make it appear accidental. Uh, well, so the, they this, find this out. <coughs> they find the guy this out. The hired to, did a, a great job making it look accidental. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and which, which is funny because, okay, so you hired someone to kill her and you wanted it to look accidental. And when you're talking to the police, you're telling them you think it was an accident. Right. <laughs> Even though it so, very, very obviously was not. <laughs> yeah, they they're pretty sure something went wrong. Yeah, well, <laughs> with the plan. I, you was, don't say was... <laughs> something went wrong. <laughs> Contrary to what movies tell you, there are not that many hired hitmen who work outside of mob circles. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. the only reason they and... they even work in mob circles is because they're making up <laughs> <get> mob lawyers. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, he didn't even try to do that. He, so. <laughs> It, it turns out, like, I mean, so um, they're not even finished their investigation and he's already uh, trying, uh, contacting the insurance companies to get the $1.1 million life insurance policy he had out on Christine. He's doing this is, everything wrong. Yeah, yeah. This is a $1.1 million life insurance policy in 1973. That's a, that's a lot of dinar. Uh, uh, there's a lot of Iraqi dinars. Yeah, so it would be probably the equivalent of about $25 million today. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> right? And um, it just, you know, didn't really add up. So l- l- later on, I mean, after he's mm-hmm. been convicted of this crime, uh, Demeter continues to attempt to retrieve the insurance payout. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how that works. You don't, you don't get it if you killed your wife. <laughs> well, that's what I don't get about this guy. Like, he seems to have absolutely no marbles in his head at all. And yet he, he, he just managed th- to become a real estate mogul. Yes. Apparently he had a silver tongue. And I think he believed he could talk even the cops into doing anything he wanted, right? Like, oh, I'll just give him this story and they'll believe it. The thing about getting cops to be corrupt uh, and, and and to cover for you is you have to actually give them something in return. It's a reciprocal yeah. relationship. You can't just talk your way into it. You have to actually like give them, you know, that, that sweet, sweet cash money. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> No, he was a cheapskate. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what <laughs> it seems no like. No way. Like he won't. Yeah. He won't get a good lawyer. <laughs> and so during during the investigation, a former friend of his mm. uh, turned police informant helped record <laughs> conversations, phone conversations in which Demeter hinted at his own guilt in planning <laughs> Christine's death. <laughs> this information, along with Demeter's suspicious behavior, were enough to gain a conviction. Uh, you know, there was, there was, they never got the murderer. They didn't yeah. have a murder weapon. They convicted him just based on the fact that he he was hinting at the fact that he might have hired somebody to do this. <laughs> you know, there's this this trend I've noticed in Canadian criminals, and it's that we're bad at it. <laughs> Well, the high profile ones for yeah, sure. Yeah, like, like we had one really successful se- well, maybe two. Now that we have that guy in Toronto's gay village, um, right? We've had two very successful serial killers, and that's it. Every other well, criminal those we've Picton had. Those Picton guys. Pardon, what was that? Those Picton guys. Th- I was gonna say they're the other ones. They're the other successful well, serial they're... killers. And then there was a Bernardo Homolka Tima. Oh, I forgot about Homolka. That's three. <laughs> but but when we're talking about uh, high profile people doing 
doing murder. Yeah. Yeah, just not very good at all. At no. It. And no. even our political corruption is usually pretty lame. <laughs> yeah, it's it's sad. It's like I took a I took a, a extra vacation on the taxpayers' dollars. Oh, what's the latest one is uh Justin Trudeau bought expensive donuts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, who cares? <laughs> Meanwhile, the Trump spends like uh, 60% of his time at his little golf Mar-a-Lago, village. Mar-a-Lago, yeah. Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> <laughs> Golfing while the country's falling apart. Like, Oh, well. Love or hate Justin Trudeau, <clears throat> at least he goes to work. <clears throat> <laughs> yes, he does. Like, he's buying donuts uh, for a work thing. He's not just buying them because... Yeah. Yeah, who cares how much he spends on his damn donuts? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the, the trial, uh, Demeter is arrested. The trial lasts 11 weeks. It's one of the longest in Canadian court history. Uh, I think because the prosecution feels they have the, the burden of proof, right? Right. So they, they don't have uh, direct evidence tying this murder to Demeter. No. They just have his really su- super suspicious behavior. They have some phone conversations in which he hints that he might have hired somebody. They don't have the murderer. Right. Um, uh, nonetheless, so so it's 11 weeks of listening to phone conversations and that sort of thing. After 11 weeks, he's convicted on the 6th of December, 1974, of arranging the murder, and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. So, uh, life term uh, might only be 20 years. Right. Right? Uh, that's Because uh, we have an upper term limit in <clears throat> Canada. Right. The actual killer was never found, although some reports suggest a Hungarian native known as the Duck was responsible for carrying out the killing. The Duck. Although he was... Yes. Very sinister Although he was name. never... <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> Kulabash. <laughs> Although he was never charged with the offense. Uh, of course, he was a native Hungarian, and he returned to Hungary after committing the murder, and he ended up dead in a, in a mo- underground mob kind of Hungarian black market thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, so no murder. Even if it was him. There's not much we could really get from charging him because he's already dead. And it's not like it would bring any additional closure because he was ultimately a tool being used by Demeter. That's right. Yeah. So Demeter's in prison. Society's safe from this unhinged individual. He's doing a life term. At At least 20 years. Yeah. Right? wrong oh because he's rich (laughs) while while on day parole in 1983 so this is uh 10 years later demeter attempted uh, to hire associates to kidnap his cousin's son what so he's already in prison for for botching one criminal conspiracy yes and he's decided he's he's learned He's learned from his mistakes, so he's yes. going to attempt another criminal conspiracy while in prison. I'm guessing yeah. it goes really well, well. Well, he was on day parole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. I, I so, apologize. That changes everything. <laughs> so Demeter's daughter was being raised by his cousin, and Demeter didn't like his cousin. And it was Demeter's opinion that his cousin was stealing from him and poisoning his daughter against him. So, he's <laughs> not mentally well. I think we can, uh, we can <laughs> safely assume that at this point. He's, yeah, he definitely is not a, a sane individual. He, he's either got some sort of paranoid personality disorder or he's on way too much coke. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> if he... <laughs> Well, you can't get anything in prison, 
but he's still nuts, right? Yeah, same that's glasses. True. S- same glasses. Um, <laughs> he hasn't changed his glasses. It's now ten years, going on twenty years. He hasn't changed his glasses. This attempt to exert his macabre control over his cousin earned him two additional life sentences. Which Demeter I, I didn't should, even. Oh, go well, ahead. We should point out to our American audiences: uh, our criminal justice system doesn't work like theirs, where if you have like yeah. multiple life sentences, you have to serve them consecu- like consecutively. Instead, you serve them all at the same time. Yeah, but this does pretty much mean he's not getting parole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. You would think. Yeah. Just just wait for it. Oh, though. of course. So he, he didn't even attempt to cover his tracks. One judge commented on his conviction that he was a true psychopath and should never be allowed to see the light of day again. Yeah. Yeah. They, um, I mean, there were medical professionals that were just astounded with this guy. <laughs> <clears throat> I've um, seen crazy before, the biggest, but not like this. Yeah, not quite on this level. <laughs> the biggest question in my mind is motivation. What went on inside Demeter's melon that would cause him to commit crime after crime after crime? He was obviously terrible at covering his tracks. Yeah, he's not a he's not a good criminal. (laughs) Yeah, he he, he's almost charming in his uh, uh, what do you want to call naivety? Utter incompetence, you mean? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. In the case of his wife's murder, he pointed suspicion on himself by attempting to recover the insurance payout. Right. Something he continued to do even after his incarceration. He's in prison, still trying to get the money. And I'm sure he the openly chatted is just handing yeah, it over. He, he openly <laughs> chatted with jailhouse roomies like Dr. Evil in Goldmember. <laughs> Member. <laughs> Telling him all, all about his exploits. The one thing you could count on with Peter Demeter was that he never changed. He even kept the same goofy, thick rim glasses. Demeter seemed to be devoid of guilt or remorse, a true sociopath, although medical professionals would argue he was instead a psychopath. I'm not entirely sure what the difference <laughs> is. Trump is a sociopath and Demeter's a psychopath, but they really read the same to me. Yeah, I was going to say this. He... he... It's this disconnect that comes with influence, it seems like. Yeah, you seem, you, you feel like you're above. Yeah. Uh, not just above the law, you're above everybody where you can just do what you want. Yeah, and, and he has that in spades. No doubt about it. Like, Demeter has that in spades. Yeah, <laughs> just really weird. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> no. If that wasn't enough, Demeter tried to have his former lawyer's nephew kidnapped and held for ransom. A second attempt at kidnapping. Yes. This is his former lawyer because he did he didn't feel like the lawyer represented him well enough. So he attempted by phone from prison to have the lawyer's nephew kidnapped and held so for ransom. So he's not even on day parole this time. No, no, he's in prison, he, talking on the prison <laughs> phone. He's on the prison phone, calling somebody to kidnap his lawyer, his his former lawyer's kid. Yeah, yeah. So this earned him more time in prison. No, no, no kidding. Really? I'm shocked. No. I'm truly <laughs> amazed and just shocked. Didn't seem to have a no-go <laughs> line. Everything was... Fair game for this. Well, he's man. already serving three life sentences. <clears throat> <laughs> like, yeah. what's one more at that point? <laughs> <laughs> now, at 85, he's 85 years old now. Uh, the notorious criminal uh, who hired an assassin to kill his model wife in the garage of their Mississauga mansion back in 1973 had applied for release for the first time in 20 years. So he's applying for parole. (laughs) Okay. At 85. But money. Um, So I like we should hold hold your breath. He might get out. Yep. But uh, uh, the parole board 
uh, says, no, you should remain in prison. This is a quote from someone on the panel. Your history of counseling others to seek revenge for you makes you more of a risk of recid- recidivism than your age and physical ability to harm others would suggest, the panel says in the decision. It's the board's opinion that you will present an undue risk to society if released. Well, because it's not like he even personally committed the first crime. No. Like, it, w- it was never a question of, could he physically commit a crime? Because the only thing he needs to physically be able to do is pick up a phone and talk to someone. Yeah. Which this apparently guy's... he does from prison anyways. <laughs> this guy is Dr. Evil. That's, that's the closest <laughs> yeah, I can like, come. He, you know, he's a, I have your a... nephew. I want a million dollars. <laughs> he's a caricature <laughs> of a criminal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very much so. But let, let's look on the lighter side. Was he a family man? We know he was a father. He had a, a daughter. Uh, it doesn't mention whether he had more than one child, but he certainly had a daughter, Andrea Demeter, uh, who, uh, who was married. Um, but Corrections Canada knows that Andrea Demeter Scratch is her married name, only wants to hear one last thing about the man responsible for her Mother Christine's murder decades ago. She just wants to know when he's dead. (laughs) Demeter Scratch, 47, who now lives in London, Ontario, hasn't visited or exchanged any correspondence with her father in over over 12 years. He's blocked from contacting his only child at her request. (laughs) For her own mental health, she says she has to distance herself from him. Um... The final straw for her was receiving a package from her father at the fitness club where she worked. Because, of course, she has a a no-go order on him. Uh, So he finds where she works and sends packages to her there. It was filled with clippings of articles about her mother's murder. (laughs) And a list of bottles of wine she she could try. The quote was from her, He'd heard I was an alcoholic. It was like, remember me? I killed your mother. Now go drink yourself to death. <laughs> oh my Demeter God. Scratch recalled in an exclusive inter- interview with CBC News. It was the most warped thing ever, she said. Yeah, it's kind of fucked. <laughs> like, not, like not to mince words. <laughs> it's, yeah. That's... Like, she wasn't an alcoholic, but he, this is what he did. He sent her clippings of her mother's death and then... I heard you were an alcoholic. Here's some bottles. Like, what? What? <laughs> what? You what? Speechless. What? I'm trying to figure out why. Like, it's very bizarre. That is such a weird thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I mean, people want to talk about it, uh, it you know, uh, true crime stories, and they might might draw a darker picture of it, but this guy's almost a, a cartoon character of uh, a, a criminal. Yeah, you well, know what I mean? like, it is dark, but it's laughably dark. It's like a, a yes. junior high school idea of dark. Yeah, it's yeah, really. It's it's almost like he had some kind of developmental delay due to his, uh, uh, you know, early life. You know, or his of, money. <laughs> it could have been. I don't know. Like, there's no clear sort of line drawn where where he suddenly switches. A switch goes off in his head, and he decides that he's going to... you got to wonder what other kinds of things he must have done in his uh, climb to the real estate... climb up up the real estate ladder. Well, yeah, and and, and that's the thing, is, like, you're assuming there ever was a switch. Like, because that's the narrative that we're used to, is that there was some switch or something that just went bad in their childhood... Which maybe yeah. there was, but honestly, he sounds like the kind of person who was maybe just like this. Yeah, just just had no conscience. Yeah, just broken, <laughs> like fundamentally broken in some way. And also bloody stupid. 
Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, clueless. Well, there, there's something about money that the more of it you have, the dumber you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I the really truly so <laughs> like uh, <laughs> That's all I have on Peter Demeter. I know it was a short, uh, short episode, but actually, we probably spent eight times as much time and effort on researching this creep than he's worth. <laughs> <laughs> still, still, some countries are ruled by sociopaths or psychopaths or idiots, and people actually will argue with you that they're actually misunderstood. Or, or playing 5D we, chess. They're yes. just, they're too smart. You just can't understand them. Not Peter yeah, Demeter. He's just them. dumb. He's dumb and yeah. evil. <laughs> <laughs> dumb and evil. That's what we could call this episode. <laughs> we leave it up to you, dear listeners, to make your decision. If you think Peter Demeter deserves a kinder, more compassionate consideration, have at it. And maybe just a suggestion. It may be time for you to consider stop sniffing glue. <laughs> I was gonna say if 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 you think he if you think we were were too mean to him, don't tell me. Uh-huh. I don't care. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't is, think we were. <laughs> what? It's just a laughably like horrid, horrid man. Yeah, just pure evil. <laughs> just unabash, unabashedly evil, like demonic. Yeah, one one, uh, one judge actually said that the one had had said that you're that you're a sociopath and should never see the light of day. Right. Um, it might might have been the same judge uh, who said you are pure evil. <laughs> yeah, he's just you're just a terrible, terrible man. You're, there's nothing good about this man. Like Peter Demeter yeah. was not a good guy. Petter Demeter. No, maybe he's Petter Demeter. Petter, Petter Demeter. <laughs> 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 Anywho, <laughs> what, what do we got coming up? What do we got coming up, uh, Mister Canuckanomicon? Um, fascism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brace yourself. I'm doing fascism next week. Are you? Yeah, Canadian fascism. Okay. I didn't know there was such a thing, but that's cool. <laughs> I'm willing to listen. <laughs> yep. We're gonna talk about the awesome. history of fascism in Canada next week. So. Wow. I bet you had to do a deep dive for that oh, one. Oh, it's painful. <laughs> Lots of painful. Nazis. <laughs> I love Canadian history because it really is painful. <laughs> Most of history involving white people is, to be honest. <laughs> well, I think history involving any people is. That's true. People are just yeah. nasty. <laughs> Stupidity isn't... Uh, isn't solely owned by whites. It's just that it's been more prominent... Uh, you know, because whites are shitheads <laughs> yeah. for most of history. <laughs> it's, it's it's true. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to be like stupid and evil and isolationist. It's another thing to be stupid and evil and imperialist. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, uh, Can- Canadians have a reputation for being, you know, apologetic and really polite. And um, this is somewhat true. But as as we learn about Canadian history, we learn that, no. Not about anything that matters. Kind, no, we're <laughs> the same dickheads as everybody yeah, else. Exactly. We're, we're not nice and apologetic about anything that actually matters. Yeah, just because we didn't have a civil war to uh, establish ourselves as a country or a big revolution, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, crappy things didn't happen. No, and and in fact, I would say that in in a lot of ways, we're just less honest about how shit we are because of that. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah, we... That's why we use poopery, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> Canadians carrying poopery around with them so that their poo don't stink. That's right. <laughs> yeah. All right, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's... thank you for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Um We're also on ko-fi.com slash canuckanomicon and patreon.com slash canuckanomicon if you liked what you heard today and if you didn't head there anyways and give us money 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Pay us for our silence. In fact, if you didn't like what you heard, you should especially give us money. Because the more money you give me... The better the stories. I guess. Yes. Yes. I can improve yeah. <laughs> my research quality and build a better sound booth if you give me lots of money. <laughs> yeah. You know what's really funny? I do listen to some podcasts, and, and when I do, I don't hear the same background echoing and stuff that other people have. And I've, I've asked, uh, uh, the one in particular is the, um, uh, what's it called? Cult of Hockey podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, David Staples and Bruce McCurdy from the Edmonton Journal. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, they they just they, they just use Skype, yeah, and and just cheap old headphones with a microphone in them, and it sounds <laughs> you know perfect radio quality. Yeah, <laughs> then here I am, you know, trying to use a digital audio workstation to mix all this. The anyway, <laughs> I mean, I could use my headset <laughs> microphone if you want. No, it's okay. I don't think it's going to make a difference. <laughs> I I just suck at music no, production. No, there it, are little tricks, um, and I think I might I might show you some of them. We can make little like sheaths for our mics that can help reduce the echo, apparently. And I've got some foam oh, like, from my new computer that we can use to make them. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I've been well, trying to well, use well, it as baffles, but I don't think I have enough of it. Like, I'd have to yeah. basically line my entire room with it for it to really work. But we can make little, oh, we can yeah. make little uh, boxes, basically, that go around our mics that can really reduce the echo. So. Well, that's great. Yeah. Okay, well, on that note, everybody, uh, you take good care of yourselves. Uh, try to stay warm, especially if you're in uh, Newfoundland. I mean, don't venture out too far. You might get lost in the snow. <laughs> or up here, it's snow today. Pretty bad. It is snowing right now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, if you get lots of money, give it away. <laughs> because. Yeah, you don't want to keep that stuff. It turns you into some kind of pure evil bastard with no conscience. And just makes you dumb. Money makes you dumb. Yeah. <laughs> money makes us all dumb. All right, take it easy. Keep your eyes open, folks. Goodbye. Economicon is a production of Crossing Clay Studios. We can be found on Twitter at Canuckonomicon, and you can contact us through email at Canuckonomicon at gmail.com. Please be sure to share us with your friends and family and keep your eyes open.